so it's a pleasure to welcome our first speaker of the afternoon is well uh, again Paul Seidel for the last talk of his series. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful conference. I would, you know, one of the important things about this conference, which had a very tight schedule, is that you give these sort of boring talks during which people can sort of take breaks. The only problem for me is uh, during those talks, I'm actually talking. So. <laughs> So, okay, so, so I will talk about cohomology operations. Okay. So take, um, take a chain complex, which is an algebra over the uh, Fulton McPherson opera. Okay, so um, so this is the algebra of chains on the Fulton McPherson space, as you so it carries operations. Okay, um, and so so there are there are operations that you can derive from this. Of course, the, the Fulton McPherson opera is quasi isomorphic to the uh, classical, you know, little disk or little square opera. Um, so these operations were defined by Cohen um, in his PhD thesis, and the, the construction goes as follows. Okay, let's see whether I can strip on this board here. Okay, so you take um, okay um, a cohomology class uh, of your chain complex. Uh, let's say for the moment, you know that we do everything. So everything. Um, with uh, coefficients in Fp for some prime. Okay, then I don't have to write the coefficients all the time. Okay, so and uh, you take a homology class in. Uh, so you take this Fulton McPherson space uh, with p of p points, and uh, you let the uh, symmetric group act on it. It acts on it freely, right, and. Um, There is this one here, what, what will I explain? So this is the local coefficient fp bracket l. So, so uh, a local coefficient system which is trivial if l is even, and l is the same as grading is here, and is um, associated the signed representation um, from the symmetric group to um, plus minus what well, sign homomorphism if L is odd. Okay. Okay. All right. So. So this is obviously well. Maybe sorry. My my sign. <coughs> okay. Um, So this is the same thing as the, um, you know, because the action is free, that is the same thing as the equivariant homology of this thing here with coefficients in this now seen as a representation, okay? So this is, this is the same thing. Um, so this is, uh, now you take the uh, p-th power map. Okay. So here this does nothing, um, so there's a symmetric group. P, F, M, P, with these coefficients here, F, P, L. And here, you go into uh, the uh, P times L homology of um, C tensor with itself, uh, P times, <coughs> which is equivariant. Okay. Um, well, So, um, so this is the map that essentially takes a, a chain x to x tensor x tensor x tensor x, which is an invariant chain, but it's not quite invariant. It has this, again, it has this, uh, this kind of sign issue. Okay. Um, okay. So now you. Um, okay. 
just because I missed the first response, yeah. what is this at? Uh, Fulton McPherson space of P point. It's like configuration space, essentially. Uh, sure. You know, the, the little disk operator. Uh, so, okay. So, um, all right. <coughs> Go on here as a, a cap product, right? A homo, um, okay, and I add in the I'm happy with my notation here, okay? But uh, equivalent cohomology adds an equivalent homology, and this is the exterior product, so it's the uh, so um, oh, very simple because I don't understand the cohomology. So you have some <coughs> problem with the map and the key efficiency. So you have some map on the key efficiency of the what is the solution? Yes? And then you simply apply that the same to standard of homology. So that's the problem. I have a map. Is it the problem with the tensor product that I have? No, no. Then you have some map on the starting, which is not new. Surely that will reduce anything on the homology, because the homology is not a parallel of the map. So which map? So which map are you objecting to? This one here? Yeah, yeah. Not object, I must. But it's, yeah. it's linear because you can... No, no, no. no. This, this map is not linear. It's not. Okay. It's so I should probably replace this by, by ordinary products. <coughs> Is that what, I'm, what you're worried about? No, is that no, how do you pass the homology then? I mean, you have a map of the efficients, but it's not in here, so it doesn't use any sort of homology. I don't really understand. The question is, uh, are you using a peak power map in your coefficients? Yes. Or only in this, uh, or, or, or only in this homology class? Uh, coefficients are in FP, right? Everything, everything's over FP, so the peak power map is the identity. Ah, it's a special brackets, actually. So homology of Fulton at first on the left is not affected by the peace power map at all, right? No, no, not at all. I didn't do anything. It's the oh, identity okay. of Fulton at first across the peace power map. Okay. 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 So then, <clears throat> okay, yeah, okay. So, so we're, I, I think we're more or less good. Okay. Um, so. So let's say, okay. Sorry, I'm making a mess of this. But let's say I, I act by the opera. So now I have. So actually, these two FPLs will kind of cancel each other out. So now you have Fulton McPherson space, you have uh, uh, P tensor copies of C, and I end with this one here. So I don't know what I did with homology and cohomology. P times L minus K. Okay. With respect to symmetric group of this space, of the original chain complex. Sorry, I, I, my chain complex should not be curly. There you go. Okay. Okay. So, sorry about this temporary confusion. Okay, but this is with respect to the trivial action. I mean, the symmetric. Here you have an action of the symmetric group on everything, um, and this thing here. So this one here is uh, is just the the ordinary homology of C tensor the. Uh, Yeah, sorry, I'm getting uh, confused with homology and cohomology. But anyway, let's say, say this is the trivial action, and I just project, project to trivial summit, summit in group homology. And you can kill me later. What, what I was trying to do and did not do very especially is to write down the structure of these operations here. Okay, so the end result is that we have um, the operations that go like this from the cohomology of C to HLC to H star of C tensor the cohomology of this Fulton McPherson space over sim p with coefficients in f p l. Okay, and the whole thing is of degree, goes from l to p times l. 
Okay? So basically, the operations are parametrized by the cohomology of this quotient of Fulton McPherson space, which is the unordered configuration space, with coefficients in this one here. Okay? Okay, I did a terrible job. Okay, and so, so the, um, again, I feel that, you know, maybe this should be. This is quotient by the symmetric group, so this is unordered. There's also a bit better power where you move. Yeah, this one here, yeah. Yeah. That's a symmetric group at the opposite. Why not? You simply rotate the quotient from one side. No, no, these are both, I mean the symmetric group acts on both sides, just on this space it acts freely. So the equivariant homology is the homology of the quotient. Yeah, yeah, because there we seem to end up with something which has a power times the quotient of the symmetric group. And we're going to come to this. We projected out of it. I projected out the, tr tr the, the, the higher dimensional. No, this is group homology. So I have, you know, h star of p sin p and I project a point. Okay. In any case, it's, it's a degree thing. So I, I, I think everybody can agree. So anyway, sorry about this. I um, this did a horrible job here apparently. Um, so what did I want to say, actually? So it depends on this one here. So I'm interested in odd degree operations. So if L is odd, okay. So what happens is the the cohomology of, of um, Fulton McPherson space with P, this is P point, divided by sim, sim P with coefficients of FP minus one, okay. So this is actually, this is FP in degrees um, p minus 1 and p minus 2, and 0 in other degrees. OK? So there's essentially, there's very little here. OK? And uh, the operation that I'm interested in is uh, this one here. OK? So this gives you an operation from um, HL of C to H uh, p times L minus p minus 1. Okay. Um, which is uh, the geometric analog, it's called xi, uh, so I, it's the geometric analog of the, um, of the uh, operation homological algebra that um, I discussed in the first lecture. So this is defined for L of all, and it's not an additive one. And it's not additive because, um, you know, the p-th power map here is not additive. Okay. Okay. So these are the operations that exist um, <clears throat> on the mod p uh, version of any chain complex, which is an, of, uh, an algebra over the little disk opera. There really isn't a, an enormous amount there. By the way, if you look at the even ones, it's sort of even worse. This is it. The, the only things I degree zero and one, and that's sort of boring. That, that descended from things with z coefficients. Okay. So um, okay. So but this this idea of uh, you know of um, you know producing cohomology operations from symmetries. Um, this of course um, is you know it, well this is the second version. The first version was Steenroth's version of of, of Steenroth operations. And what I want to talk about is uh, quantum Steenroth operations. So okay. Um, so how do so the so here the quantum Steenroth operation? We assume that we have a chain complex, uh, which is an algebra <coughs> over the operand um, of chains on the lean Mumford space in my somewhat weird notation. Okay. So in my my notation, the lean Mumford space D is what usually we call M bar so D plus one. Okay. And so you can apply the same thing here, and uh, the outcome are operations here. Uh, 
in principle, which um, okay, which go like this. So instead of having uh, the Fulton McPherson spaces, you have the Lean Mumford spaces. So the outcome is um, So they're parametrized by classes in the equivalent cohomology of the lead Mumford space. So now, um, you know, let's think a little bit, okay, about the, the so, so we have this Delean Mumford space here, and we have the action of the symmetric group of order P, and P is prime, okay? So the action, before that the action is free, here the action is free except for one orbit um, with, um, with isotropic groups, which are isomorphic to Z1P, okay? And so this one here, um, so it's, this is the P equals three case, okay? Okay, so this is this fixed point. <laughs> under z p. Okay? So, um, let's call the orbit O, okay? So this is a point star in O, okay? So you see on this one here, there is the, um, you know, you can rotate, so, the, the, so this is the, you know, this is the zeroth point, this is one, two, up to P, and they are arranged symmetrically here, so you rotate them, cyclically rotate them. Um, Okay, and so, so this is the same curve. So this is a point that has isotropic group Z mod P, and there is exactly one orbit, and everywhere else it's free. Okay, so um, so the main thing that you want to maybe use is is cohomology classes which are um, you know associated to this, which are just um, so let's say the. Maybe you want to use, uh, you know, I mean, so to make this into, a, to make a concrete operation on C, you pair with a homology class, right? So if you look at the homology class here of this orbit O, okay, so this is the equivalent homology of essentially, you know, sim P divided by ZP with these coefficients here. And that one is actually the, um, ZP equivalent homology of a point. Okay, so we can just use things, um, and you know, to be totally honest, so, so these things, um, you know, by the localization theorem, right? So the the equivalent homology of this um, looks like uh, the equivalent homology of O plus uh, some stuff that's finite dimensional or sort of n. Okay, so most of it is actually carried by uh, this one here. So we, we just use that one uh, for simplicity, and uh, and so we restrict to to this one here, and we get operations which are called quantum Steenrod operation. So they now go from H L to C to H star C tensor H uh, star. Uh, Cp of a point, okay. uh, p times l. Okay. So um, I, I, sh I should say maybe a, a couple of things. These are um, maybe not terribly familiar. So, so when you define classical Steenrod operations, right, um, you do the same thing except you use uh, the equivalent cohomology of of a point, right? There is no person there. Yeah, there's no opera, it's a point opera, right? Yeah. So, so, um, or, you know, so um, in that case, you know, for the classical Steenrod operations, um, what's responsible here is the cohomology uh, of the point with respect to the symmetric group, which is much smaller than the cohomology of Z mod P. It sits inside it injectively, but it's much smaller, okay? Sometimes people use the, the cyclic subgroup um, 
you know, for technical convenience, that gives you a bunch of extra operations which aren't actually there. They, they turn out to vanish. However, in this case here, you know, there is no point that's invariant under the symmetric group. So there are qualitatively more quantum steamrod operations than there are classical steamrod operations. Okay, deal with it. By the way, these are all also, okay, these are all additive. Or on cohomology, yes. The reason why they're, called, why they're additive is because you know everything becomes additive after you act on here by the gen, by the degree two generator by sort of uh, you know uh, so is a sort of Tate version of the of the uh, power map is additive. In this case here, uh, a multiplication by the degree two generator acts injectively. Okay, so so everything is additive. Um, okay, so so for. Now I'm going to say something very sloppily. Okay. Um, so, so this one here, by the way, this is one dimensional in each degree. So you have one Steenrod operation of each degree. Okay. So I'm, I want to look at the same thing here. Okay. So the the Steenrod quantum Steenrod. Maybe up to some weird constant, I, I don't know. So, um, so what, what do I mean by this? I mean, there, in principle, there are two things that are defined in different contexts. Okay, one is defined for algebras of a full to my present spaces. The other one is defined for algebras of the lean Mumford spaces. But of course, the lean Mumford space is stronger. So if you have a, an operator of the lean Mumford, algebra of the lean Mumford space, you can use the map from full to my present space to the lean Mumford space and make this into an algebra of a full to my, of, of a full to my present space. And therefore, it has Cohen operations. But in fact, in this situation here, the quantum <coughs> steel and the quantum core, actually, in this particular degree, they coincide. Okay, it's a question of you know comparing the equivalent homology of both those spaces. Okay, and this is, for instance, useful because the, the you know generally speaking, this operation here is not additive. But in the fact where you in the case where your operator comes from one over the lean Mumford space, it is actually additive. Okay. Okay. Having given what was possibly the worst possible introduction to cohomology operations ever given in the history of mankind, uh, I can now go to symplectic geometry, okay, to the applications of this. Okay, so, so let's start. It. So, so I, as usual, so I have, you know, X is a closed symplectic manifold. Manifold. And, uh, so the first Chern class is assumed as a final condition, okay? And uh, so I will apply this, this construction of uh, quantum steamroad operations to a uh, group of Witten theory. So the outcome is that you have a quantum steamroad operation here, which is um, a sum, obviously, of contributions over classes of, uh, you know, holomorphic spheres here, okay? Um, quantum steamroad A, and just to make it Sure that uh, we know what we're doing. So this quantum steel was well, maybe I should put the prime here. Okay, p comma a is equal to um, uh, okay. This, so it goes from H say L of X with coefficients in F P to um, well, H star X. P. Um, okay, let me say say it like this. So there's t and there's theta. Okay. T is two and theta is one, and they together form the the cohomology ring of h star z p of a point. So if 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 you have a positive prime, then you know this the square of this is zero. And but anyway, it's one dimensional at each degree, and there it will be it will be. So P times L, and then there's the usual thing that comes from, you know, from the quantum part. Okay. So the so these are the quantum steamrod operations, and uh, okay. Uh, so the yeah. That's correct. 
right? Because they all work mod p, right? That's correct. So, um, okay. So the um, okay. Um, I'm gonna save you, spare you. So the the so if you set a equals to zero, right? You get the classical Steenrod operations, right? With some horrible constants that you know you can look up in Steenrod and Epstein when they define the uh, Steenrod operations, um, which I will spare you for the moment. So the um, okay. So now we say okay. So I want to I want to look at a particular operation here, right? Which only I, I'm going to look at the odd cohomology of p. Okay, goes to the odd cohomology of m p. And uh, let me call this operation q xi p. Okay. So this is the same thing. So this is the so this is the t to the p minus one over two from p greater to or theta equals to two component of uh, of the um, quantum steam rod p okay so this is this component that also corresponds to the cohort operation uh, times sorry I can't help myself p minus one over two okay um, so I, I want to look at this particular one so this is the one that you know to which this this uh, this is exactly the one to which this one here applied, okay? So it also occurs as a colon operation, and therefore you would expect it to play a role in this formal group here. Okay, and indeed it does. So okay, so recall we have a formal group. mc of x, so mc of x evaluated on some adequate n are solutions of quantum Maurer-Catan. same diagram that I have drawn many times. So this is the um, Maurer-Catan solutions in this one, particular one here, T F P T over T to the P plus 1. And we have the same thing. Okay. And this is the P power map. So here I'm going to reduce to the Maurer-Catan equation for T F P T over T squared, which is the odd dimensional cohomology of X with coefficients in F P. Here I have this um, operation here, Q Xi P. Okay. Um, okay, and uh, so we here have the Maritan with T P F P T over t to the p plus 1, which sits inside here, and this is a mesomorphism, and this is a commutative diagram, and I guess I should call this a theorem. Okay. So this is actually something that, that you know, you can think about in the abstract world of, well, okay, so there's two parts of this. So one, one part you can think of it, you know, purely abstractly operatically in terms of fulton mcpherson opera. So I define this, this formal group law in terms of fulton mcpherson opera, and you can think of the pth power, which here is heavily truncated because you divide by t to the p plus 1. Okay? Um, and uh, you, know, you think about what it does, and there's a certain cycle in, 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 in Fulton McPherson space uh, divided by the symmetric group, which is responsible for this. And then you, you know, that cycle is exactly this kind of colon operation. And then you identify the colon operation with the uh, quantum steroid operation. Okay? Okay, so this is, you know, I haven't quite finished proving this. So it's, Seriously, but what, what? Why isn't the argument used here? Uh, it depends on your notion of proof, right? I mean, I would like to have everything explicitly spelled out. I'm kind of assuming that everything I say is wrong unless proof otherwise. Um, so, okay, so yeah, so that's essentially proof. So, what's the point of this, right? In particular, what's the point of writing this thing here as a quantum steamroll operation? So, the point is computation, okay? 
So, maybe you can say maybe some already. Why do you want to do this thing? Well, because I want to figure out what the formal group is. I see. Right? So, okay. This is why it's known as deep power. Well, that's the first piece of information. It's just like if you had an elliptic curve, yeah. that's telling you whether it's got height 1 or height 2 at, at, at P. Okay? I would say that's, that's your first piece. Right. Um, okay, so, so quantum steam rod, steam rod by uh, localization. So this is a kind of joke on me because I always hated localization computations. But here the localization computation is applied not to the target space X, but to the actual, uh, you know, actual uh, space of stable maps in terms of the domain. Okay? So we have this... Sorry, I'm not drawing it very well. We have these, these three points that are sort of arranged symmetrically. Okay? And this is the output, zero. Okay? And so we can act by the cyclic group on this, and this also acts on the, on the space of you know, stable maps with this thing here as domain, okay? And uh, we can ask ourselves, so what is the fixed point set? Okay, because after all, the quantum steam rod operations are sort of obtained by an equivariant integral over this space of stable maps um, that have this thing here as domain. And so the equivariant integral should, of course, localize. Okay. So, so let me make the simplest assumption here. Okay, assumption. Okay, so A. That would be the simplest case you can look at is of lowest possible energy, possible. Well, first churn class. So the first churn class flexibility to A is as low as it can be taking into account that you have to have a holomorphic map. Okay. Okay, so in particular, you know, there can be no, you know, no degenerations of these stable maps and no multiple covers and so on and so on. Okay? And so you might think, well, so So for the so the fixed point set of the action on on the space of stable maps Because if there are stable maps that have this particular curve here as a domain, well, you can think, well, the, the thing that you immediately think about would be, you know, p-fold covers, but under this assumption there are actually no p-fold covers. So maybe it's fixed point free, well, it's not quite, right? So you could have, um, okay, so there's two things. You could have this here to be the constant map, okay? And then you have some map in class A that's attached to it. That's a possibility, okay? This is, uh, if you, this is called I mentioned one, okay? And, um, you know, it's fairly easy to, to see, so when you, uh, when you do equivariant localization, uh, um, you're supposed to take uh, the equivariant Euler class of the normal bundle to this, okay? So I'm gonna give you the formula, but let's see what happens here. So this one here, right, so the, the, so the normal bundle is, uh, you try to glue those two uh, curves together, so it's a tensor product of the tangent bundles of those two curves, okay? So you have the tangent bundle of this holomorphic map at this point here, okay? Which is with a topological line bundle. Then you have the tangent bundle of this. This thing here is identified with a fixed domain, so in principle <coughs> this should be trivial, except of course the ZP action acts on it, so it has some weight. Okay, this is the normal bundle, okay? The second component here, is um, you could have, sorry, this is, I have to draw this a little bit more carefully. So you have your P points, one, two, three, okay? And um, there's another fixed point of the rotation, and you could have a map attached to here with uh, no mark points, okay? So this is, in fact, this is of core dimension two, okay? Uh, because, well, it's a nodal curve, but the node is attached at a specific point. Right? And so when you do the normal bundle of this, there's two things. One is, again, you could uh, you know, undo this node here, glue them together. So there'd be, a, a, again, a tautological line bundle here, some trivial line bundle with an action here. And that's the other one where you could just move the point. 
Okay, you could move the point where you glue, which is again a trivial lambda, but again it carries an action. Okay, so so the outcome of this argument is the following thing. Excuse me. Complex co-dimension. Yeah, complex co-dimension. Actually, you know what? Secretly, I'm actually thinking that I'm on an algebraic variety. Um, the main reason being because otherwise people will harass me about the smooth structures and moduli spaces, which are actually irrelevant. I mean, localization doesn't really need smooth structures, but I don't want to have to explain this. Okay. Um, so okay. So this is somewhere. Okay, there we are. So the so the so res the result is the following lemma, okay, which holds under that assumption there. Okay, so the integral. So let me take the quantum steel rod square, some prime p, um, p and class A, and apply it to some class, and then I cut with the other class and I integrate. Okay, so this is equal to minus t inverse. T is the equivalent parameter, right, uh, in H2 of BZP, okay, of um, x0, uh, 1 plus T inverse tau. This is the equivalent class of the normal number, so gravitational descendant. Then comes the ordinary steamroll operation, and I should probably just explain this in a second, okay. This is a two point invariant, okay, again evaluated at class A. Uh, so this is the co dimension 2 part, and the other one is, okay. Um, Okay, this is a, a one-point invariant, one minus <coughs> t inverse tau. So tau is the gravitational descendant. These things you have to, uh, is a geometric series, right, secretly, okay? Steel rod p of x1, this is the cup product, again, a, this is a one-point. Okay, why do the classical steel rod operations occur here? Well, that's easy to explain. Here you have, you know, the constant map, right? So you're taking the p inputs and you're essentially applying classical steel rod as if this was a point. Okay? And the same thing is here, well here it's a little bit more complicated. You have classical steel rod but with an additional marked point. Right? But you, know, you could think of this as classical steel rod with a cup product uh, with f. Okay, uh, okay. So, this, so this is a formula and you can actually use this, um, but it's obviously, it only covers the lowest possible degrees. And this, I think, you know, up to errors that I might have made, this is a perfectly provable formula. I mean, you, you know, you assume that the moduli space is smooth, it maps to A, and so on. And it's, it's really a straightforward application of localization formula, okay? So now I want to replace this assumption. The problem is that you only get the lowest log trivial degree, which is nice. I mean, it's something, because, you know, as, as far as I know before this, the only ever computation of quantum steel rod squares was in Nick Wilkins' thesis. So, um, Okay, so um, so I want to impose a, a weaker assumption, which still so I mean clearly, you know, for the general quantum steel rod powers, you know, the main excitement comes from multiply covered maps from p-fold covers, right? And this is actually great because we've been looking for a way to understand p-fold covers for a long time. Okay, so something that counts them, I think, is a plus. But I don't want to get into this. Okay, so whoopsie. Uh, Okay. So I want to make the weaker assumption that we can't write A is equals P A1 plus A2 plus and so on plus AK, so any K greater than to 1, where AI are represented by holomorphic numbers. Yeah. You were saying that um, you wanted to imagine where the algebraic is there some tension between that and whatever technique you're using to get integrality? Tension between what technique integrality and? I mean, you say we're using Fano. Yeah. Okay. So let's say that. So the argument is straightforward. If I assume that there is right geometry and I assume that in modern case of right To be honest, in the slowest degree, it tends to be the case anyway. Examples. But if you want lowest degree and work in symplectic geometry. Um, it is actually still true, this thing here. You just have to, you know, when I say the normal bundle, you know, I have to mutter something. But, you know, when you look at the proof of the localization folder, 
It doesn't really rely on smoothness so much as having reasonable tubular neighborhoods. Okay, so um, you know, so uh, I mean, the localization does not hold for an arbitrary topological ZP action because those are presumably horrible, <coughs> right? But if the you know, if the action is locally nice, and it doesn't have to be locally nice in some you know really terribly consistent way. So yeah, so I'm, I'm good. So the weaker assumption is that you can't write this as p times some class plus maybe some other things. So still no multiple covers. Okay, and in that case, you get a third mixture here, which is um, okay. Which is you get the so essentially a combination of these two things. So you get the constant map here. Then you get some a1 here attached and some a2 attached to the output. Okay where A1 plus A2 is A. So both of these things can happen at the same time. What cannot happen is, for instance, that you have spheres bubbling off at each of those points. That's a fixed locus, because there would have to be P spheres. So that would allow you to write the class A as P times something plus something else. Okay. So now this is pure speculation here. Um, I mean, I don't think it's an unreasonable speculation, is that um, we get a an additional term here, which is t minus 3, which kind of combines these two phenomena here. So it's x0, uh, 1 plus t inverse 2, inverse. Uh, and then comes, you know, you're gluing those together here. So there'd be some class, OK. So this is for a1, and then so this is a dual basis, EK, EK dual in homology, the usual thing. Okay, so then comes the classical steamroad operation of x0 times times uh, 1 minus the same thing that you had here, t inverse tau inverse a2. Okay. You know, you can't read it, but it's okay because it's just a conjecture. And in the example that I'm looking at, this will actually, uh, anyway, um, disappear. Because this case is, I mean, in this case here, there is certainly bubbling, right? So if I work, you know, remember these, these, this, uh, uh, this theory with FP coefficients does not have good virtual cycles. Or if they are, nobody has explained me what they are, okay? So you have to do things sort of by hand. What I'm essentially counting on is that, you know, the bubbling occurs in this way that this one here will be a tree of curves. And that one will be, a, will be some kind of tree of curves. And those things, you know, for the equivariant aspects, is sort of irrelevant. So I'm hoping that these will cancel as usual. But, you know, um, I have to take a deep breath. Okay, so the real fun is the examples, okay? Okay. So, so you have to to the session, then, you have to then I wouldn't have to worry about this, right? But the, in, the, in the virtual thing, there are double and triple branch uh, covers and so on. You know, maybe if I thought really hard and I could figure, you know, I could say there are no covers which have, which are p-fold covered. And therefore I can still get an FP theory, okay? It's, that's an option. Um, but you know, I, I, uh, I'm not an expert at those kinds of things. In fact, I kind of suck. So, okay, so, the, so let me do an example, okay? Okay, so, so here's the example, okay, so x, in P5 is the intersection of two quadrics, which I announced. Two quadrics. Okay. So if you look at um, H2 of A, um, it's, it's uh, generated by, uh, sorry, H2 of X is Z, is generated by some class A, and uh, the final index is two, which makes your life enormously easier, okay? So uh, to compute the operations that I want here, uh, I am going to set B equals um, P minus one over two, I hope, times A, let's say um, P odd. The, 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 for, for the prime two, this QXI2 uh, vanishes for, for purely for degree reasons, so, uh, which you, know, you can complain about. But. Okay, so what's left is, uh, from the, so it's from that formula here. So the thing is, um, okay, what, what should I say? So most of this falls away. I'm not going to give the details. Uh, I don't have the time anyway. Um, 
the, uh, so what happens is uh, the final index two condition is important. What's also important is that you know when you use topological recursion of relations to get rid of the descendants. So first, let's say you use a divisor relation to insert a a degree two cohomology class here to have three mark points. Then when you apply the, the topological recursion relation, you'll end up with something which involves one of those classes, cup product with the, with the degree two class. Okay. But these classes are in degree three, the cup product will be degree five, there is nothing in degree five. So the, the upshot actually is that uh, this term here and this term here, they both disappear. So we end up with the following thing. So this is, you know, here I'm evaluating for x0, x1 in the odd cohomology, which in this case here is just in degree three, okay, and fp, which is fp four, by the way. So the, um, okay, so the x0 quantum steam rod, um, okay, for this p and this particular class b, that I want x1, um, is equal, oh, sorry. so this is x0, x1, in h3, x, fp, okay? So this is equal to, um, so these are these, uh, some kind of weird things. So this is, this is uh, something that comes, you know, so what I'm going to use is, you see, it reduces to the classical steam rod power, okay, let's call, apply to x1. x1 is in h3, okay? So there's x1 squared, but that's zero. Uh, the box thing is also zero because these classes reduce from integral classes. So the only thing that's left is the degree zero classical steel rod operation, which should be the identity, but in fact, you know, if you define steel rod operations like that, it's not quite the identity. It is, so there's some weird constants here. Okay, so t to the p minus one over two. Okay, then comes the gravitational descendant here, which is applied to, so to, um, P minus three uh, applied to you know the cup product of two. So the, in here you have x zero and x one, which are both. So this will be a, essentially x one up to a sign, c root of x one. Then x zero times x one. These are both h three classes. That's a point um, up to some multiple here. Okay. So this is this is one in class B, and then there comes the ordinary cup product x zero. Okay. So this is the formula for this quantum steam rod contribution, and it involves the only thing that's left from enumerative geometry is uh, this one here, okay? So I remind you, this is a coefficient of what's called the quantum period here, okay? So the sum uh, over all A, um, you know, Q to the um, C1 of A um, to something on point, to what? Uh, okay. Uh, C1 <coughs> okay, there you go. Um, okay, so this is N class A. So this is known, so this is called the quantum period. And in this case here, it is uh, the sum over all D, um, Q to the 2D, um, 2d factorial squared over uh, d factorial to the 6. Okay. This is a pretty straightforward um, application of the sort of, you know, given tal mirror formalism, straightforward meaning that I try to read given tal's paper and then I get depressed, then I, I think I understand it and compare it with what the Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences says in degrees up to 8, and then I finally email Tom Coates. And Tom Cotts, so, it's so good. So what do we have here? So we need the correct coefficient. So this. So therefore. Okay. So this coefficient here. Well, I just erased it. Okay. Um, so the the. Um, so quantum uh, xi. I think I called it. Okay. Xi p minus one. Well, there was this thing here that I put in uh, arbitrarily uh, when I defined it. Um, so it was p minus 1 over 2 factorial, okay? And then I have to uh, address putting these guys here, okay? So it's minus p 
minus 1 over 2 to the inverse. And uh, the coefficient here for p equals minus 1 times uh, <coughs> p minus 1 factorial squared over p minus 1 over 2 factorial to the power 6. Okay? And uh, which is equal to uh, minus 1. So this is times the identity, right? So this is the identity. Here I get the same parent here, so it's a multiple of the identity. And it's minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 times the identity. Okay? Which I announced to you guys yesterday. Okay. So now I said, I really hope this sign P, I've been fighting all through this week to get this sign here to disappear. Because I said, well, if it's the identity, the P's power map being the identity for all P, that just means that I'm looking at the formal neighborhood of the identity in the multiplicative group GI. Okay? And uh, I don't know how to deal with this one here. Well, appeal to the audience word. Okay? So there is a single group that you can write down. So this is the, this is the Pth power map of uh, G hat, the completion where G is just the circle group x, y minus y, x, where x squared plus y squared equals to 1. Okay. So this is an uh, you know, algebraic group, but over a non over an algebraically closed field, of course, it's, it's the same thing as GM, but generally speaking, it's not GM, it's called a non-split torus of rank 1. Okay. And it's piece, we can also think of it as x plus i, y. But i is not, i is just a symbol that has i squared equals minus 1. Okay. But if you do that, you see that the piece power map will actually lead exactly to this behavior due to the i's. Okay? So the question is, so the conclusion is that uh, the derived Picard group of the Foucault category of x has a formal expansion near the identity that has this thing here as its leading term of the mean power maps. And, um, I think fairly likely. I mean, if this was actually, a, you know, if this was a genuine commutative formal group, right? I, I'm pretty sure it would follow that that it's G hat, because this is a very, very non-degenerate formal group. Because it's constructed as this functor, and I don't really know whether it's representable. You know, you can't really say anything. But the question is, how would this one here possibly appear? Okay. Okay. So there's a, you know. The Foucault category of this thing here was, was looked at, of course, not arithmetically, but, but over C, uh, with complex conditions by Ivan And Ivan proved that you know, there is a, a direct sum of this, uh, which is the Foucault category of a genus 2 curve. Okay? Now, uh, the deep pick of the Foucault category of a genus 2 curve is very straightforward. You know, the automorphism of the Foucault category is given by tensor with fat line mode. So it's H1 of your genus 2 curve with coefficients in Gn. Excuse me? Also, what is the criteria? Well, so his computation is, is, uh, is over C, right? So this we're going to talk about in just a second. So, um, so, uh, so the question is what's actually happening here? So when you look in, uh, so this I cannot say for sure because it's a, you know, it, I have to go back to the paper. So when you look in Ivan's paper, what's actually happening is that it's not so much of a category of sigma. You see a certain bundle of Clifford algebras over the genus 2 curve appear. So I think the um, a, a possibility is that what's relevant when you do things arithmetically is a sort of twisted version of the Foucault category involving uh, the uh, bundle or something, a gerb or something of, of Clifford algebras over um, Clifford algebras with respect to this quadratic form here. Okay. And that would cause then the data that you put on a Lagrangian submanifold, or rather you know, the data that change one brain structure to another brain structure, to be not a, a local coefficient system, but you know, a, a flat G bundle. But I can't quite figure out how this works. So again, appeal to the audience. If anybody knows how to modify the Foucault category in this way, I'd be delighted. Okay. So this is. Um, so, I, but you know, I, I, well, of course, or maybe I was wrong with these signs, but now I feel more inspired, right? It's 
kind of hard to get, you know, wrong signs because your conventions will often actually have a meaning. Okay. Well. Okay. So uh, let's see. So what about this one here? A, a cubic uh, threefold. Okay. So degree zero, degree three hypersurface, right? So this has an uh, odd cohomology. I think uh, a ten-dimensional odd cohomology. So that there is. Uh, And uh, so assuming, assuming that the, this formula here is true here, okay. this one here works. <coughs> so the, this, this assumption is always satisfied in these cases. This is quite similar to the other example, meaning it's got Fano index 2, and the first Betty number is, uh, second Betty number is 1. So, okay, so this is actually 0. Because when you look at the formula here, uh, you have a 3D uh, factorial that's enough to make it 0 or P throughout. So what is going on here? So again, if you ignore the arithmetic aspect, you just say, you know, let's forget about this for a moment. Well, of course, mirror symmetry of this has been proved by Sheridan. And, you know, the mirror is a certain number Ginsburg one. So I don't actually understand the derived Pika groups of Landau Ginsburg models very well. Okay. But let, let's do a, a, just a pure thought exercise, okay? So suppose you take a projected variety and you just uh, say Calabi Young and you consider the associated Lambda Ginsburg model. Okay, so you make, make the cohen over this, you take the Lambda Ginsburg model, it gives you a category which sub is two priori. Okay? So um, instead of, you know, so when before that, um, you know, you, you had you know, holomorphic vector fields and line bundles, so essentially it was the, you know, H, H1 is the infinitesimal automorphisms. Now you have all the higher, like H, H3, H, H5, and so on, that you can in principle. So the question is, you know, what are the algebraic groups, if they exist, that are associated to that? Um, and I wouldn't be totally surprised if these were all additive groups for the higher things. So there's no actual global topology that you can generate. And you know, that would certainly explain this one here. So of course, the, the, the additive group has p power maps, not just to, to all the p, but generally speaking. So that, 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 that will actually be 0. Um, just a guess, of course, again, the, the Sheridan's, uh, um, well, first of all, Sheridan's argument is not actually arithmetic. But we could just say, let's just ignore it and pretend that the answer, which is defined over z, is correct over z. Uh, then there is still a lot of work to do. So the, the final example that I would like to have done is, you know, x is a p3 plus p1 blown up, sorry, p3 blown up an elliptic curve, okay? But that has final index 1, the enumerative geometry is enormously more complicated. So at the moment, I cannot really uh, deal with those computations. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions? Yes. If I wanted to say, mm. yes. Can you define this kind of general operation there? Yeah. I mean, why? Well, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I mean, well, okay, just a second. Sorry. You can define the particular one that I need here because it's also a Cohen operation. So all I need to say is that the Hochschild cohomology of an algebraic variety has a structure of an algebra over, over the little disk operators. Okay? For the general uh, Seder operations, you need to extend this to delete Mumford. So you need to put in the degeneration of hodge Duran. Okay? But we're in characteristic P. So you need somebody more hardcore than me to say whether, whether we're good or not. You know, for in, in symplectic geometry, the, the the duration of Hodge Duram holds of the closed string sector for geometric reasons. For example, if P is yeah, if P is big, then you don't have a problem. But then maybe it's not so super interesting. <laughs> maybe it is. Yeah, I mean, they, they come in various degrees, right? So, yeah, so in principle, yes, it's, it's a bit beyond my <laughs> The one that you use. The one that I use is certainly well defined. And, and then one has to worry about none of this business. It is probably kind of like a Z, et cetera, which 
after that. Well, I mean, you, you would need the mirror to be found in the Z, right? Which I think you know, is pretty much the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Oh, well, let's thank all of you.